Um, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Appreciate you all being here. If you all are in San Francisco, I'm sure you've been keeping close tracks of the skies. So we're glad to be able to join from the safety of our homes and all of that for this wonderful talk this afternoon. My name's Colleen and I'm on the programming team here at The Battery and it's my pleasure to introduce our talk today, which is Uncharted, How to Navigate the Future with Margaret Heffernan. I'm gonna just introduce a little bit about our speakers and then pass it over and have them get started. We will do a Q&A towards the end of the talk, so please save your questions to the end. We'll do it through the chat, so you can put in your questions there. We have you all on mute for now, just to avoid any background noise or anything like that, but please feel free to be engaged on the, on the chat. So our, our speaker today, Margaret Heffernan, is a Texas-born, Cambridge-educated author, former media CEO, award-winning journalist, and BBC documentary maker, whose TED Talks have been viewed more than 12 million times. Her previous Six books include Willful Blindness, which was named one of the most important business books of the decade by the Financial Times. She's appeared on NPR, CNN, CNBC, BBC, and has written for the Fast for Fast Company in the Huffington Post. And our moderator today is Kevin Smockler. Smockler, log on. Excuse me, excuse me. Kevin Smockler <laughs> is a creative in residence here at the Battery and the author of three books about popular culture and co-director of a brand new documentary film called Vinyl Nation about the comeback of vinyl records in America. It's available right now on our Fringe Benefits page, so if you want to check that out, please feel free to go over there and buy a, a ticket rental um, in support of local organizations in San Francisco. And he has appeared in conversation with podcasters, architects, authors, and academics here at The Battery. So I'll pass it over to you, Kevin. Thanks, Colleen. Thanks, everybody, for being here. It's, uh, it's so good to see a few uh, names I recognize and, and folks outside The Battery as well. I look forward to seeing you around the halls of The Battery soon. And uh, thank you so much to Margaret for being our, our featured speaker uh, this, this afternoon in San Francisco on what is pretty late in, uh, in the UK where you are. So we appreciate you taking some time and I'm eager to dive into this very interesting book I just finished up this morning, actually. Um, so I was, uh, I was very excited to read Uncharted and make my way through it and spend a bunch of time with you and your work over the last week and a half. I'm curious to know, where um, uh, in the course of, of, of a career where you have uh, gone far and accomplished much, uh, where were you intellectually speaking when the ideas for Uncharted started to coalesce? That's, yeah, thanks Kevin and thanks to everybody who's joined us. Um, so I had, I had just written my fifth book, which is a tiny book that the people who run TED had asked me to write. And, um, and I always have a couple of ideas in my head for books. Um, and they usually come from very random things that I start to notice. And in this case, it came from random comments people made, one of which was um, a friend of mine who said, you know, I think if I knew I was gonna live longer, I'd drink more. And I thought this was kind of hysterically funny um, because I thought, well, yeah, but if you drink more, you might not live longer, right? <laughs> so, so I thought well, that's just such a funny kind of paradoxical view of the future. And then, you know, the run up to the Brexit referendum here, people kept saying, what do you think is going to happen? And then in the run up to the presidential election, people said, what do you think is going to happen? And I kept thinking, why do they think I know? And all of these very trivial things stuck in my head and made me think they all expressed a view of the future that struck me as quite weird because it was as if they felt that the future is a secret that somebody knows. And if they just could find that person and persuade them to give away the secret, then they too would know the future. And I thought, but the future hasn't happened yet. How can you possibly know it? So anyway, that just made me very fascinated in ways historically that we've thought about the future, ways currently that we think about the future, and why they all don't work. And I think the other piece of the puzzle was um, reading a lot of Philip Tetlock's work on forecasting and coming across a really, you know, a, a really nerdy data point, and I'm a kind of collector of nerdy data points, which said that he thought really, you know, the furthest out you could do accurate forecasting now was about 400 days. 
And that's if you're very meticulous, you consult a very wide range of sources, you don't have um, strong opinions, you maintain a very open mind, you're constantly adjusting your forecast and you're assigning it a probability. If, on the other hand, you're like the rest of us, the horizon for accurate forecasting maybe is 150 days. And this really stuck in my head because I thought the whole premise of most businesses and governments and so on is forecast, plan, execute. And if you can't really forecast, then how do you function? And so on the one hand, I had these kind of magical beliefs that I thought were kind of interesting. And I, on the other hand, I had this, you know, gigantic question and I thought, right, this is, this is something, this is what I need to dig into. And, you know, four years later, <laughs> there's the book. Oh, Kevin. Thank you. Oh, there we go. There we go. Problem of the 21st century. Um, I'm on mute. Uh, the, um, I, I, I was, I love the way the, I love the way the, the book began. Um, and, and, and if it was a book by Bill Bryson, I feel like the first chapter would have been called a brief history of economic punditry. And, uh, <laughs> um, Maybe that's I, what I should have called it. <laughs> and, I think it was such a brilliant choice to open your argument with because it talks about sort of three of the of the founding ancestors of economic punditry um, and it takes economics as a as a social science that is both deeply dependent upon predicting the future and deeply insecure about its ability to predict the future um, economists are proud of of how unemotionally attached to their subjects they are and they're also always scurrying about saying we're as scientific as physics, which are two, which are, which are two instincts that seem that seem uh, uh, at cross purposes with one another. Tell me about the choice to begin the thesis there. Yeah, well, the thing that really interested me is I started studying in you know, the kind of history of forecasting, and I read a lot of um, books by the founding fathers of forecasting. Um, they were all quite big, big pundits in their time, so they all wrote memoirs, which was, in, you know, helpful. And and certain things jumped out at me. One was the three that I chose to focus on um, were all afflicted by tuberculosis at some point in their lives. And tuberculosis is a really interesting and complex disease because you might have experience an attack of it and then never suffer again for the rest of your life and live to a ripe old age. Or you might die in a, in a period of weeks. Or you might go for years and years and years and then something would trigger it again. So it's a very mystifying disease. And it, um, and it dominated um, the world's population. I mean, there was a sense at the turn of the, you know, from the, from the 19th century to the 20th century, where almost everybody was inf infected with TB, but many of course didn't even know it. Um, but these three individuals had had something happen in their life. They knew that they had TB. So they had a very visceral understanding of uncertainty and a deep personal motivation to try to know the future and kind of make a future of their choice. And they all had extremely weird and funky ways of combating the disease. So um, one of them, uh, Fisher believed that you would be healthier if you chewed a lot. And therefore, if you chose very chewy food, you would be healthier. So he encouraged people to eat the breakfast, the new breakfast cereal then uh, grape nuts because it's so immensely chewy. Another one, uh, Babson, believed that you know you, living in very cold air was good for you. There, so there are these amazing photographs of him sitting in a very long kind of dressing gown in front of an open window in Massachusetts in the winter. Having lived in Boston in the winter, I would tell you that's a really deeply uncomfortable thing to do. Um, but what they were trying to do is they were trying to figure out how does the future happen and how does it happen particularly in financial markets. And they had this fundamental belief, if we have enough data, we can know the future. 
And I would argue that this is exactly the same argument that many companies in Silicon Valley pursue. You know, selling apps that will predict your child's outcome. Um, selling apps that will, you know, predict who you're going to love or marry or when you're going to die and, you know, all this kind of stuff. Um, so exactly the same thing. I mean, the technology is fancier now, but the motives are identical. And, the, and they existed at a moment which was really fascinating, which is it was a time where there was the telegraph so you could communicate across big parts of the country. It was the beginning of, the, of statistics as a real profession. So you had the tools with which to interrogate the data. And you had a national transportation system which meant you could print newsletters and distribute them all over the country. So you had in much the way that we had at the turn of the 21st century, this concatenation of technologies that made all sorts of new things possible. And what it did for these guys is it made it possible for them to be pundits and to build systems that they thought would predict financial and economic outcomes based on theories, which we might now express as algorithms, um, which, which people believed in. Now, you know, some of them were deductive, some of them were inductive. One of them, Babson, was just completely random. Right? But, you know, they could make big arguments for why they were right. And they attracted huge followings. And not just on financial outcomes, but on things like, you know, diet and international spelling and all kinds of things. I mean, they were true blue pundits. They would answer almost anything. And of course, the big test of their genius was the Wall Street crash. And, and they all failed this test. Um, two of them, uh, Persons and Fisher, because they didn't see it coming at all. And Babson did better than the rest because he'd been predicting a crash for three years. So sooner or later, he was going to be right. But even he gets it wrong because a, uh, you know, a few months later, he says, OK, it's over now. And, the market's going to bounce back and it didn't bounce back for years. And I started with them because I, I liked the fact that they, you know, they had a deep personal understanding of uncertainty, a very deep motivation for trying to eliminate uncertainty. Um, and I think that they're very emblematic of how forecasting fails because they had models that didn't work. They had very vested interests and they had a commercial business to run. And these are three of the forces that make a lot of punditry so unreliable. And, you know, there's a lot of research that shows, for example, that um, the more famous a pundit is, the more, more likely they are to be wrong because they have big ideas to which they're attached and they see everything through that lens. So it was, it just seemed to me, I mean, I'm a history buff anyway, but it seemed to me that at the very beginning of the for, of forecasting as an industry, you have these endemic problems that so far nobody has eradicated. I'd love to go from there to a, a midpoint of your book, which where you where you discuss the concept of scenario planning, which oh. is uh, which is a has has a kind of I, I'm not sure. Uh, a Silicon Valley hotshot would use that term because it has a bit of a mid-century wonkiness to it. But um, and sure enough, it came out of it came out of the military following World War II in, in, in hand in glove with the Rand Corporation. Right. Uh, I actually would not be surprised if we went to the Rand campus in Santa Monica if there was a scenario planning hall or, or right. assembly area we could visit yeah. or something like that. Um, but what you conclude, and I believe quite rightly, is that present-day examples of scenario, present-day successful examples of scenario planning, given the flux and complexity of the systems we live in now, are highly dependent about having a diverse set of perspectives around the table and in the room. Um, and this is, and this is, that although you don't use this word specifically, this is precisely the opposite of what in, in, in contemporary business lingo we refer to as culture fit. Because, mm -hmm. because the very word culture fit means right. smoothing out those differences uh, right. amongst the people around the table. Let's talk about that, that, that contrast. Yeah. So you're quite right that, you know, scenario planning starts in the military, but it really starts a, acquiring a, a business application at Shell under the aegis of a, a rather eccentric 
French executive named Pierre Wack, who felt that planning lived primarily in the finance function, which in most companies it still does. And therefore it could only deal with quantifiable data. And therefore it was going to miss lots of things. And Wack believed um, very deeply that there are all sorts of forces at work that couldn't be quantified. And if you miss them out, then you are kind of flying blind. And what we would say today, the way we would put this is that he understood uncertainty and it's one of the defining characteristics of uncertainty that it cannot be quantified. And so if you limit yourself to planning only in dealing with what can be quantifiable, you're gonna miss the big stuff. And so he, he really perfected a, a process for collecting a lot of soft data, a lot of unquantifiable data, and a process for building a number of scenarios, usually three or four, of possible futures, which were all based on the same data. So, you know, all the same ingredients, four different outcomes. And the question then was, if this scenario turned out to be true, because it's plausible, and it's based on fact, it's not magical thinking. If this came true, what would we do? So the point was not to come up with a bunch of scenarios and pick one, because it's an acknowledgement that a lot of this stuff is out of your control, but to go through each one and say, okay, if this happened, what would we do? And then to look at those <clears throat> possibilities and say, well, how many of those things should we do anyway? And the very famous example is when he ran a scenario saying, and this was in the 1970s, what would happen if, we, um, if the oil price fell and everybody thought he was a nutcase and said, don't be stupid, it's a limited natural resource, it's always gonna go up. And he said, yeah, okay, but so what? Let's just think about it. And they came up with all sorts of things that they would do to protect the company against it. And they all seemed to be perfectly plausible things to do whether the oil price fell or not. And then when the oil price did fall, that's the moment at which Shell actually became a leading oil major in a way that it had never been before. And they credit the scenario planning exercise to you know, seeing the rise of China faster, seeing the importance of climate change faster and so on and so forth. I think the really important thing is, and, um, and, I th and I've talked to some people at Shell who would agree, is A, it definitely gave them greater strategic insight than they would have had any other way. That's for sure. But it also changed the culture because you can't go through a process like this without quite a lot of argument and debate because don't forget, nobody's an expert on the future because nobody's been there. And so it took a very uh, archaic, uh, hierarchical, bureaucratic culture and created an environment in which if you had a good argument at the, you know, as a 23 year old newbie, you had every much as authority as the CFO. And this radically changed the culture in terms of what one could say, what one could see, what one could think about, what one could propose. So I think the thing that to me was so fascinating about scenario planning is it definitely helps you see both opportunities and threats that otherwise your entrenched beliefs will blind you to, which is really what my book Willful Blindness is about. But it will also let you see opportunities for innovation or change or efficiency or whatever that you simply would never find any other way. And it has this sort of beneficial side effect, side effect which is it hugely increases the collective intelligence of the organization. It, 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 seems it, to, seems, it seems to require the belief that unknowability in a paradox, in a seeming paradox is part of planning, like part of- Yeah, and I think, I mean, I think that's really crucial. And, you know, you all know that the first third of my book is about, you know, why forecasting of all kinds, you know, whether whether it's economic forecasting, whether it's thinking history repeats itself, whether it's personal profiling and DNA, why it all fails. Um, and when I wrote that, I felt really strongly that, wow, this is 
a really unpopular argument <laughs> and it's a it's a it's a steep hill to climb and um and of course covid kind of came in and won the case for me fundamentally but i thought until we can really get wrap our heads around this idea that we do not know the future that we can be going down the road and we think everything's hunky-dory we think we know where we are and bang something will happen unless we can accept that that is always possible we don't know where we are and you know in many ways i mean i couldn't have designed a better example of that than what we've just lived through and you know i launched my book in the uk on about the 28th of february right and my editor gave this lovely speech saying, you know, at the beginning of this year, we were thinking about where we we're going to go on vacation and what exams our kids had at school and, you know, what the, what the quarterly cycle looked like. And now it's all blown up. And I think, you know, the important thing for us, you know, as traumatized as we may be by this, is that potential is always there. And it's on there on a big scale and a small scale. You know, my, Google Maps may say I can drive to the post office in 17 minutes and it may be right. It's an average. It's not going to be 17 minutes if a kid gets run over or a cat runs across the road or um, or I actually don't have any gas in the car. So it's still only an estimate of how long it's going to take me. And, you know, Google for all of its data cannot predict any of those things. So I think, you know, we've become seduced by a lot of technology that kind of smooths over the bumps. But the fact of the matter is uncertainty is always with us. It is an ineradicable fact of life and we do better and we see more. And I think we're fundamentally more creative when we accept that. Creativity is a, is a good, is, is a good, X factor in here because you have a wonderful chapter in this book. I say entirely self-servingly as a as, as an artist in residence at this organization called Think Like an Artist, um, which is that artists um, exhibit both patience and, if not necessarily a comfort, an understanding of the value of unplanned, unstructured time and 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 that being an example of not knowing what will come next. Yeah. Because, uh, because even, even if you have a, a, a fairly refined creative process, as I do, I believe very strongly in the anecdote that Tom Waits likes to, likes to put forth, which is that he was stuck in traffic and an idea for a song came along and he couldn't take his hands off the wheel to reach for his tape recorder. So he simply looked up and said, do you mind? I am busy. Please come back later when I am no longer driving and I will, and I, and I will tend to you in that song. <laughs> um, and sure enough, that's what happened. I, I don't know which song of his it was. Um, mm. But what that seems to, that example, uh, and, and, and I, think, I think many companies love the idea of an artistic spirit or soul uh, within the organization, they see it, they see it as like a perpetual, like casual Friday or, or, you know, free donuts or something like that. It's an injection of levity and spirit into, uh, uh, into the organization. Uh, how, how do we have, if that is important, how do we have the patience to let it do as, how does an organization have the patience to let it do its good before applying all those organizationally forces to it, to get it to be, quantified, managed, uh, 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 to, to produce metrics, et cetera. Well, I think the sad fact is that on the whole, organizations don't do that. They don't have the patience that their um, discomfort, that they become very addicted to their metrics, their KBITs and all this kind of stuff, and that they're seeking. You know, what can we do to make our creative? And I always say, well, what are you doing to stop them being creative? And almost everything they're doing is to stop them being creative. 
So they're giving them deadlines and they're giving them schedules and they're asking them before they make anything to please describe exactly what it's going to be. So they're ruling out all discovery. And, you know, you and I were talking earlier about how when you started making your documentary, you thought it was about one thing and it became another. And that's a really exciting moment of discovery, especially because it shows you how rich your subject is before you did it. You would define that discovery out of your schedule. And I think that's what many, many organizations do, that they simply can't tolerate the uncertainty. And there's a quite nice story, I think, in the book about 3M, which, of course, for a long time was very famous for its innovation. And then they got a new CEO who introduced Six Sigma into 3M. And, you know, so this is full of, you know, schedules and targets and goals and all this management mumbo jumbo. And lo and behold, innovation pretty much left the scene. And the, the CEO after that abandoned Six Sigma and said, look, you know, you cannot go into the office and say, I'm going to schedule two good ideas on Wednesday and a good, another good idea on Friday. It simply is not how it happens. And so what that means is that you have to have enough looseness in your system to make space for the ideas that come and the experiments that people want to do. And that's perfectly feasible unless you're a slave to efficiency, in which case it looks wasteful. And I think this is something, you know, many of the organizations I work with struggle with because in some parts of the organization, they quite rightly need efficiency. So for example, I've done a fair amount of work in pharma. If you're manufacturing drugs and medical devices, you want precision and you want efficient drugs or medical devices. You need a lot of time and space for mind wandering and for experimentation and to try something that fails but gives you an idea which leads to an idea which gives you a different idea that eventually becomes something. But it's a very squiggly path. And the minute you try to make that efficient, you kill the creativity because efficiency really is effective when you can control the environment and you can predict the outcome. But it's in the nature of innovation. The whole point of it is you can't predict the outcome. And I think the other thing I would say is that um, innovation doesn't respect hierarchy. So you can get great ideas at every single level of an organization. And that's you know famously at the bottom, but sometimes also at the top. And the more hierarchical your organization, and the more you fall in for these rather ludicrous idea of high potential people, I don't know what everybody else is supposed to be, but you know, this, this notion of ranking people, um, the more you really is, uh, make it guaranteed that people at the bottom aren't gonna dare to have ideas people at the top aren't going to dare to have ideas because they're too busy hanging on to their spot at the top. And the people in the big, fat, safe middle are just hunkering down and hoping nobody notices them. So, you know, because we've had a lot of companies that used to think, well, the way to get real innovation going is assess everybody all the time, create a very competitive culture, and then they'll fight with their ideas to get to the top. And actually exactly the opposite happens, which is everybody just struggles very hard to stay boring enough that nobody notices them to long enough to fire them. So I think, you know, I think the truth is that companies need to be clearer about where efficiency counts and where it hurts. And they have to understand that you can't operate the same homogenous culture across both kinds of activities. Your book is, is very much an argument for the value of patience, which is, mm. which is something, which is, which is a message we all need dur during, these, during these very unpredictable times. I, I'm curious to know if in your experience and research, the, the patience placed on an organization, and I'm sure this is different if we're talking about a company versus if we're talking about a branch of government, for example, it, it, is, it, is it internalized? based on the company's history and the way it's always done things, or is it an, is an external pressure 
foisted on them by, by investors, uh, 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 grant makers, um, uh, uh, people, people yeah. who's, who expect results in a, in a timely fashion. Yeah. Well, I think in most environments that I've worked in, you know, whether it's companies or um, advising very large organizations or governments, I, you know, generally what I see is impatient patience, right? Which is, there's a great sense of urgency, but there's also an understanding for how long things take. And it's quite interesting because I think everybody imagines that they can kind of force creativity or achievement. And you see this at the moment, for example, around the debate regarding vaccines. Um, so the fastest we've ever developed a vaccine is four years. The average is 10 years. And everybody's running around saying, well, we're just going to do it in you know, no time flat. And the truth is that we have started working on vaccines for beta coronaviruses in 2017. So we already have quite a lot of time on the clock. Um, vaccines are extremely difficult. There are many diseases we've been look, trying to design vaccines for and still fail. There's no vaccine for AIDS, for example, although we've been working on it for 25 years. Um, but there's this notion that if, it, and I think this is very based on things like um, the Manhattan Project or, you know, landing a man on the moon, that if we just focus all our efforts on it, then we can force it to be faster. And this is a classic example of affirmation bias because we forget all the times that that didn't work. War and cancer, not so, not so successful. I remember um, working, you know, years ago in a call center, we're doing fundraising for the Michael J. Fox Parkinson's um, Association, which promised a cure by 2000. And I quit because I thought it's a lie. You just can't do that the complexity of disease and vaccines is so great. You can't force it. Now that doesn't mean that you're just sitting back and waiting for a miracle, but I think we, you know, you saw this also with Google X and their moonshots, you know, they're going to do all these amazing things. You know, Google has turned out to be very good at acquiring innovation, but not so great at actually doing, making these quantum leap discoveries, however much money they throw at it, how many brilliant people they throw at it because it's a very random and unpredictable process. And so I think, you know, when you look at companies that have a really solid track record of innovation, they are pretty patient. They are quite loose. I mean, I'm thinking of companies like Arup and W.L. Gore. I mean, I think W.L. Gore has more patents per employee probably than most companies in the world. Um, but what they know is they can't predict it. And this frustrates people who have no patience, right? And they like to think, come on, if I throw enough money, that will solve the problem. But it depends, you know, any innovation depends on so many other things. And, um, and there's a point at which you have to be quite humble. And it's really interesting, you know, there's a fantastic Irish poet named Patrick Kavanagh who talked about artists as having patient humility and no sorry humble patience and humble courage and the then the patience was about waiting for the idea to coalesce and the courage was the courage not to let the idea go and i think that really speaks to the heart and soul of creativity and innovation which is um it requires great tenacity and courage but um but it also requires a kind of respect for the process, which is in the end, it kind of takes as long as it takes. Absolutely. Uh, we, we're going to, we're going to be, it's going to be time for Q and a soon. So if you have uh, anything to ask Margaret about uncharted or any of her other work, uh, please place it in the chat. And I believe Colleen will be administering the questions um, and to make sure they get, they get to Margaret um, a, as a way of, you, you both begin and end the book, um, Uncharted, by saying this is an optimistic argument. This is an argument. This is the, this is not an argument to say that the future is unknowable, so we may as well hide under the bed until it's all over. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, the uh, 
However, phrasing that argument for uh, an organization, which is, a, which is a big slice of the work you do, uh, versus phrasing that argument for an individual, and the individual, it, it, the putative individual in this case, is the person reading the book. Tell me, tell me how you uh, phrase the optimistic argument of Uncharted when talking to an organization versus when talking to, say, your neighbor or, 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 right. or an average person. Right. Well, I think with organizations, you know, my, my, my main message is, you know, if you wait until all the data's in and you have all the information you need to derive a master plan, you'll be behind. Um, in fact, you may become swiftly irrelevant. That actually what you have to do is you have to keep doing experiments to understand where is there room for development? Where is there room for innovation? Where is there room for improvement? And the more you do those as a matter of process, the better you will understand the complex world and ecosystem that you inhabit. And the, and the sooner you will see those opportunities that allow you to make a great leap ahead. Um, I think with, with individuals, I would say something very similar, which is, you have to, you know, if you want to have a really rich and interesting career, instead of waiting to figure out what is the perfect smooth path, at which point by the time you see it, trust me, it'll be a very crowded sidewalk, right? The better thing is to keep, you know, doing experiments with yourself and in the world, moving towards things that interest you, um, being driven by your curiosity, and not being afraid of what that might make you want to do. Now, obviously, you know, I'm very biased. I've had a very weird career, starting in broadcasting. Then I ran tech companies in Boston for eight years. You know, now I, I write books and I advise companies and I teach at a business school and I do a lot of broadcasting. And so I didn't, you know, I don't think I ever had a plan. I think not having a plan has been a great advantage to me because it's alerted me to opportunities. It's also made me think when I got stuck that, well, you know, this may, the plan may be working, but actually where you are right now is just horrible. Get out, get out quickly. Um, so I think the strange thing about what I'm saying is really, it's about being more alert to the world around you more prepared to take risks and more spontaneous in what you're prepared to notice and act on. And I think that this is predicated on the notion that the, that the future is unpredictable. And so if you want a long-term career that will stay relevant, it has to be about your capacity to notice and to act on what you notice and not to get as addicted to your plans as I see corporations get. I mean, I, it was funny, I was talking to a company today and they were saying, you know, our plans are laminated. <laughs> Once we've got a five-year plan, we just stick to it to come hell or high water. And of course, that's exactly how companies lose their way. It's how they become irrelevant. It's how they miss huge opportunities. And I would say the same for people's life plans. I think it's really good to have one as long as you don't stick to it too rigidly because you may miss a fantastic opportunity that's staring you in the face because you're just following the instructions. Indeed, indeed. We, we, we actually have a question that just popped up in chat. Um, Colleen, do you, would you like me to ask uh, Margaret the question indicating who it's from or do we wanna unmute that person and have them ask it? Go ahead and ask it on behalf of them. All right, this is a question from Amy Lee, who is in the room. Uh, she, uh, she says, hi, Margaret. I always tell uh, my children and professional colleagues and subordinates that life is all about iterating. That being said, how can we improve our skills to iterate? Hmm. Well, I think, you know, I agree and disagree. Um, I'm a very big believer in experimenting and then seeing from one experiment where the next experiment lies. But I also think that the danger of iteration is that you risk perfecting something that's fundamentally mediocre. Um, so I, you know, what I tend to think is that it's quite useful to have a very long-term principle towards which you work. 
So for example, in my own career, and I wouldn't hold this up as, you know, the poster child for a perfect life, but, you know, in my own career, I basically thought I want to do work that I think is relatively useful or good for the world that I really love doing. And I'm going to live on whatever it pays me. And sometimes it's paid me really well. And sometimes it's paid me really badly, but actually that's, those are my values. That's what I want to work towards. And if at the end of my career, that's really what I've done, then I think I'll be a happy person. Um, now that doesn't, that isn't me starting as I did in radio, thinking I want to iterate my radio career and then iterate my radio and my television career. It's really, it's really thinking about what am I moving towards? And in fact, what happened, you know, is I worked in radio, I worked in television. And at one point in television, I just thought, well, this is all a bit dull now. I mean, I can, I'm a perfectly good filmmaker. I can make lots of programs. I don't think I'm the world's greatest filmmaker. Um, and I'm in my mid thirties and I can see that I could stay employed in this job and I could definitely become a better filmmaker. But if I don't think I'm ever going to become really excellent at it, well, it would be fun to try something else, which was pretty much the moment at which I decided to move back to the United States for a while and ended up, you know, I had no plan at that point. I ended up working in tech, which was fantastic. And I just loved it to bits. But that was moving towards something which was different. And I was going to, I was curious about it. And I thought at the time that some of the things we were doing were good, was good for the, were good for the world. And, um, and so I think, you know, I think you have to have, I think for the iteration not to lose its point, you have to have some kind of long-term goal or principle, which is, which, which allows you not to just start adding more angels to the head of the pen. Because I think there's a point at which iterating something that's become irrelevant isn't progress. Uh, we have another question here from JP Harbor, who says, I am fascinated with sports gambling, uh, which uh, based on <laughs> uncertainty and tight deadlines and big money and how casinos create odds. Obviously, sports gambling institutions do not have a crystal ball any more than the rest of us do. Um, what insights right. are they using in addition to statistics and a supercomputer? They lose some days, although year in and year out, they are profitable and seem to predict scores exactly sometimes. Yeah. Well, the great advantage they have is they're working within quite a rules-bound environment. Right? Football is football, basketball is basketball. They have a lot of data about the individuals and the players and exactly as, as he says, you know, statistics and so on. So the kind of margin for error is pretty small. Um, it would be a very different ball game, so to speak, if you asked a, a football team to play basketball and started betting on that. And I think real life actually isn't very much like football. It isn't as rules bound. There are all kinds of weirdnesses that can get injected into life that can't get injected into football or baseball or basketball. You know, that nobody's, you know, on, on the whole, nobody's just randomly going to land a plane in the middle of the football field, right? And if they did, you'd call the game off. So I think the, you know, the reason it's more predictable, and of course, even that's not completely predictable, is because it's much, much, much more rules bound than real life. And real life has become less predictable because it's become so much more complex. So you have a situation, you know, where some kid in Iraq can tip the political balance by setting off a bomb. One person can change global politics. You don't have that extreme of possibility in a football game because you can't introduce random players into it. So I think it's much more predictable because it has so many rules around it. And of course, if you think about gambling, well, I mean, gambling isn't unpredictable because the house sets the rules. So that's an extreme example of being rules bound. Um, 
And it's really funny. I remember being in Vegas at one point and going to see Penn and Teller. One of them said, you know, is anybody here a mathematician? And then laughed and said, well, of course not, because if you were a mathematician, you wouldn't be here, you know, because you would understand that the odds are so profoundly against you. Um, I, I have, oh, we have, we have another question from Anne. How do we as a society, uh, how do we as a society begin to reverse this mega shift from prediction to propaganda? And can we? Mm. Well, it's really interesting. I mean, I certainly think we have to get alert to it. I mean, there's quite a diatribe in my book about the pro propaganda around driverless cars, um, you know, which have been endlessly predicted, even though, um, A, they haven't turned up yet. I think Sergey Brin said they were going to be here in 2017. I'm very glad I didn't, you know, bank my lift home on that. Um, and in fact, what we know is we've seen people ent exiting the driverless car market because actually they've come to understand as you really dig into it, how phenomenally complex it really is. Um, you know, that if they're not gonna work in snow and they're not gonna work in fog, you know, that's, that's not an insignificant limiting factor. And if you have to put all pedestrians in cages, you know, that creates some civil liberties issues. And it just goes on and on and on. It's like. You know, it's a classic scientific issue. You know, the closer you get to the problem, the more complex it becomes. And I think what we have seen, and I would have to say that the tech industry, you know, it really goes for this full tilt, is huge amounts of prediction is really propaganda. So it's both trying to tilt the market in their favor. It's trying to impact wages. For example, it's trying to code, kind of dominate or terrify particular industries. And I think we, you know, it's exactly the same as fake news and we all need to get very, very much more alert to it. And um, I mean, the tech industry has been famous for selling vaporware for as long as I worked in it. But I think what I've seen in the last 10 years is much more insidious than that because it is about you know, putting pressure on wages for very poorly paid people. Um, it is about kind of creating a dynamic where infrastructures won't necessarily get built because, well, we don't need more roads because we're, when we have driverless cars, we're not going to need so many roads, you know. And so it's, it's starting to impact policy in a very, I think, a very deliberate way and a very insidious way. And I would just say anytime you read a prediction of that ilk, you know, just think about it for five minutes and you'll be able to take it apart. This is just salesmanship. It's another form of propaganda. You know, PR, propaganda, advertising, it's all the same game. Uh, we have, I think we have time for one more question, uh, maybe maybe two more questions. Um, uh, I, uh, this is from Meg. I love your comment about culture fit. What organizations do you see truly embracing diversity? And what are the keys to successfully allowing the bumpiness? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I have to say, honestly, I see a lot of, and I've seen for years now, a lot of lip service to diversity. I've seen much less real progress. And I don't say this with any happiness at all. I mean, I'm pissed off that for, you know, I first started writing about women's careers and everybody was all gung-ho about diversity and they didn't really mean it. It's my, my impression because, you know, honestly, organizations that really want to get something done, get it done. And we haven't seen big shifts in terms of diverse representation at every level in organizations. And in, see, in fact, what we've often seen is exactly the opposite. You know, whether it's Susan Fowler's ex uh, experience at Uber, you know, whether it's misogyny within Google. I mean, we've just, you know, whether it's the explosion of, of Me Too, you know, which was a sort of surprising event, not that it happened, but that it hadn't happened earlier. And so, you know, how do we change the game? I think it's partly we have to hold leaders' feet to the fire on this. And I think we have to insist that when policies are drawn up on this front, that the people that they're going to impact are part of that discussion. I mean, I was 
flabbergasted by the number of companies that came out with anodyne statements that, you know, when there were huge protests after the death of George, George Floyd. And they had, they issued these statements without talking to any of their African American employees or consulting any African American organizations. And they just thought if I come out with a bland mother, motherhood statement, I'll look like a good guy. And it's not good enough and nobody believes them anymore. And with math, you know, so much transparency these days, I think companies, then sooner or later people will regard their existence as illegitimate. Because we've already seen, thanks to the COVID catastrophe, that you know, those worst hit are also those people on whom our lives most depend. And so if, you know, if we are depending on people to go to work so that we have food in our supermarkets and nurses in our hospitals, sooner or later, all of us are going to feel these people need to be properly represented and properly rewarded and given proper opportunities. And I think one of the really positive things about Black Lives Matter is how incredibly diverse the protesters were that this is now a feeling of a common cause, not a special interest cause. And the last thing I'd say is I had the huge privilege of meeting one of the greatest diversity champions in corporate America is an individual named Ted Childs. And Ted is African-American. He worked for many years at IBM, which was an absolute leader in diversity. And one of the things he said to me was, you know, one, if you want to champion diversity, you can champion any group but your own. Because if you champion your own group, nobody will believe you and they think you're just working from self-interest. So when he was um, at IBM, he championed women, he championed um, gay community, he get, championed the disabled. He did not champion racial diversity. He asked his white counterparts to do that. And he said, that's the point at which you get a much, much more honest conversation going. Because once it's clear that you're not working in your own self-interest, then you can be really frank. And I think, um, you know, I've thought about this a lot because, you know, when it comes to diversity, as far as women's concerned, you know, HR is hugely dominated by women. And I think they're hugely well-intentioned, but as they fight for diversity, everybody misinterprets them as fighting for themselves. And women will win this cause when men stand shoulder to shoulder with us. Indeed, in the words of a, in the words of a great Texan and a hero of mine, Barbara Jordan, we have to be big because the task before us is a big one. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, the book, of course, is Uncharted by our guest, Margaret Heffernan. Uh, please pick it up. I had a great time reading it. Uh, and I think you all will too. Um, Margaret, do we have a, a final word for, for your, your, your new friends here in San Francisco before we, <laughs> before, we, before we sign off and say goodnight? Well, I think Kevin, you know, you said it's an optimistic book and it is an optimistic book, but you know, not because I'm a, a complete idiot. You know, I recognize that these are very, very difficult times, but I also think that human beings have incredible ingenuity a capacity to collaborate, a capacity to experiment that will get us out of this eventually. I think that what holds us back is a feeling that we have to see the whole route before we dare leave the front door. And what I would say is, you know, in a very complex environment, waiting for that master plan wastes precious time and energy and effort. And what I believe now is that it doesn't really matter where you start, only that you do. Couldn't have said it better myself. Margaret Heffern and everybody, thank you so much for being here. It was really thank a pleasure speaking so to you. Thanks a lot, Kevin. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Everyone, have a good rest of your day and good night.